Hi everyone, we just want to welcome you here today. Um, Mr. Sullivan, Marvin Sullivan, is going to be our guest speaker today. For many years, he was a teacher at Pendleton County uh, Schools. He, taught, he was my teacher in, seven, in the uh, 11th grade, <laughs> English. Uh, and I have to tell everybody that. Um, so, uh, but anyway, he is going to be, he left. Did you leave during my school, my year, or did you leave the next year? 81 was my last year. Okay, so you were there the whole time I was there. And then he got this bright idea that he'd run for um, circuit court clerk, and he won. So he left the school system, and he spent a lot of years as the circuit court clerk. And today he's going to talk about those experiences for us. So we'll turn it over to Mr. Sullivan. Good to see everybody out today, and thank you for coming. And I hope that the few things that I say will maybe some of the things that you don't know, but like I got two here, Alice and Ruth Ann, and I'm glad to see them. And that is one of the keys to whatever success I had is you got if you have good help and you get along with them, and we certainly did. And there's a few funny things that I could probably tell, but I won't do that. But I'm glad that you came. Um, I'm going to start out with uh, just a couple things here. Louisiana blossom on a watermelon vine. I'm a tall Georgia pine. I got Georgia on my mind. I'm a Tennessee waltz. I'm an all night scene. I'm the Florida sun. I'm the Silver Springs. I'm Hawkins Tom down on the old folks at home. I'm Clingman's Dome. I'm corn born. I'm the stars that fell on Alabama. Coffee in the morning. I'm country ham. A dusty delta dawn, a Carolina moon, magnolias in bloom. I'm a thoroughbred grazing on Kentucky bluegrass, pecan pie and tea of sassafras. I'm the Mississippi River around in the bend. I'm gone with the wind. Y'all come back again. I'm Spanish moss hanging from a live oak tree, southern fried chicken on the cypress leaf. I'm the birth of the blues down in New Orleans, a land of dreams. I'm an Annabelle at home on the Natchez Trail, a rusty plow on the old home place. Azalea's blooming on Mobile Bay, I'm the Virginia Reel on Derby Day. Oh yes, I'm Southern Hospitality with a Nashville sound. I'm a patch of cotton, I'm an old coon hound. I'm Daniel Boone, Robert E. Lee, I'm the Seminole Choctaw, I'm Cherokee. I'm the Grits for breakfast, I'm a blue bayou. I'm turnip greens, but I'm telling you, I'm everything good, 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 honey, y'all ever dreamed about. Hush your mouth. I'm from the South. Woo! <laughs> not you, not you might, might have one. That, uh, one hour, 35 years ago, down in Pikeville at an auctioneer's convention, and I have to have it for a recorder. They didn't have the things like technology like we do now. They have to get those words. I don't know who wrote it, so any time that you don't know who wrote something, you to you just take credit for it. They don't know the difference. <laughs> but anyhow, uh, I'm glad to see everybody. It was an honor to serve, and I enjoyed teaching. I maybe well, I'll try not to talk about that because I don't want to spend much time with it. But I sincerely enjoyed teaching at a time when uh, kids, when you had a mother and a father at home, and they had three meals today, and they knew how to work, and they had a work ethic that lasted a lifetime. And I really, really enjoyed that, but I was so happy because it was another experience that I had, you know, being a circuit clerk. I was a circuit clerk for about, Allison, uh, you might check this, I think it was 19 years. There were six six year terms, which was a, a good thing. 
and then they gave us one extra year because they wanted to get it on the same time. But I uh, uh, learned a lot just by observation, and uh, I formed a lot of opinions about things and had some thoughts on things. And I learned one thing too that really was successful. That you know, when you're around lawyers and judges and the public and criminals and, and everybody. You know, it's better if you sort of just keep your mouth shut instead of blowing off and not like you know everything. And I think the one thing is service that people, if you're an elected official, that you don't just wave at people, uh, you know, when you're running. You, and and there, there's really no reason if you treat people right with courtesy and, and all the things. The criminals, and I know I also complimented and read them both, they were just as, as uh, nice and courteous to the criminals as to the other people. That's important. Our records here in Milton County, the circuit clerk's office, goes back to about 1808. That was the earliest that I could. Now, I know Kentucky was the state, I think, like at 1994, 1794. But you, you know, it, they uh, uh, came from a part of uh, Campbell and Brackett County, and then it took a while to set up, you know, legal stuff. That's why it runs into it. But I did run into some very interesting things, like Patrick Henry. He was the governor of Virginia. That was when. Kentucky was uh, part of Virginia, you know, where you had the land grants that the, in the 1800s, they started having a lot of problems because the when the land grant, they gave thousands of acres this one, and then as land uh, became more uh, valuable and uh, uh, more population and what have you, then you had a lot of court cases that involved real estate. So I ran into Patrick Henry's uh, 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 land grant. Also, Simon Kenton. Simon Kenton and Daniel Boone were right here in Pendleton County. There was a farm that Dave Dunaway and I were selling about five or six years ago. And I ran into a case uh, that uh, Patrick Hink, or, uh, Simon Kenton was uh, in Kenton County when he was an old man. He's probably in his 80s. But they took a deposition and they were trying to figure out where this land was. And this land was over on Ashcraft Road there. Where Kincaid Creek after it passes through the park and goes down and it goes into the main Lincoln River, big uh, uh, part of the um, the Pettit Farm, and big bottom there. And so they questioned Pat, uh, Simon Kenton, oh, Mr. Kent, Mr. Uh, uh, Kenton, what were you doing there anyhow? We, we all camped out. He said, well, we were uh, uh, had a campaign going. He, Dan, he said, Daniel Boone, Colonel Boone was on one side of my, the main Lincoln. And I was on the other. That was this uh, the, where the uh, Pettit Farm is. I said, what were you doing there? And he said, well, we were chasing the savages. And of course, the savages and the clerk had marked through savage because he was clearing up the language a little bit. What they were doing, they were chasing the Shawnee out of this country. So you, you can run into some things like that. Another thing that I've learned in just by living life is to try to be patient now. Sandy probably would disagree with me. I'm probably already impatient. But uh, Thornton Wilder, my, one of my favorite writers, says that when you come near the human race, there's layers and layers of nonsense. And that is certainly, certainly true of today. I found out, too, that in, in the court business, almost every time, and I'm not saying that you don't win a case, but there are very few winners in the court Room. If you can, try your best to stay out of there. If you don't ever in there, you're better off than there ever. I found out another thing, too. Now, not everybody lies, but there are more lies that have been told on the witness stand after they're under oath than, than there are truth. Uh, it's sort of like when Falmouth and Pendleton County used to play basketball. Competition was really, really strong. The referees, if you were from Falmouth and you saw the referees, you thought they were darn crooks. The way they did. If you were Pendleton County, you thought the, crook, the same crooks was there. Not everybody lies, but anyhow, I found that it has no particular category. Now, nothing against teachers, because we were teachers, but I've, I've seen that teachers on the witness stand have seen lie. Preachers have seen lie. Police, I used to think all them told the truth. They don't. The lawyers and politicians and, and anything like that, that you can pretty well do that. So much of the court cases uh, involves domestic situations, and that's like a husband or wife or boyfriend or girlfriend, and it seems like there's more and more of this. I, I've learned one thing too, after the heat and passion of youth and, and early marriages cools down a little bit, you better have to have something else or you, it won't work. 
the other thing is that uh, uh, the thing back in the early cases, when, pers when a person does something wrong, uh, they always want to blame somebody else. You notice that that's that hasn't gotten old nowadays. They just they do this. I really believe this from what I've just a little bit I know, and, and of course I've, I've lived lived life a long, long time. Is that I don't think things are as bad now as they were 50 or 75 years ago. I believe that that right now we're a little bit more civilized. Now we have so much to do, much more population. But I certainly believe this uh, uh, this trend. I'll try to show you that because I'm going to share a couple cases with you and, and tell you what it was like. You know, we'd like to think about the good old days here at Bowman. Yeah, they were good, but also we had problems too. Uh, this writer, her name is Mary, uh, was Mary Hope Whit, I think it was. She wrote this little thing. Most people think it's a think it's a children's story, but it's not. It's called The Spider and Fly. If you haven't read that, for goodness sakes, do that, and you'll see one big thing about all the problems that we have. It's about this little fly that uh, uh, flies around, and, uh, and he gets real close to the spider. Of course, the spider acts real nice, and, and uh, finally the spider gets him. I'll show you uh, that what happened here, and I'll try it. It won't be an opinion, so I may be completely wrong. No, we won't argue that today. Just think about it. There was a guy named Paul Lawrence Dunbar who wrote a very, he was a black man. He lived in Dayton, Ohio. Didn't live very long, died at an early age, but he set quite a, an impression on people with his poetry. He was an elevator operator. That was when you just didn't get in like we do today, a bunch of buttons like this, but you know, manually you show, uh, manually you close the door and he puts you up and down and what all this stuff. He wrote a poem that, uh, really fits the category of attorneys. Now, attorneys are a lot like doctors. Doctors, when they operate on somebody that's maybe 80 or 90 or 100 years old, and they've got one foot in the grave and the other on a banana peel, and uh, they now say, well, there's no use operating on this. Well, the attorneys are the same way. Uh, they, when they represent somebody, they have to do it the best of their ability, I guess. I, I, I watched Perry Mason, so I really like that work. He wins all his cases. <laughs> but, but anyhow, Paul Lawrence Dunbar, and a lot of schools are named Dunbar, like Lexington Dunbar. That was named after Paul Lawrence Dunbar. But he wrote a poem that was uh, The Lawyer's Way. <clears throat> I've been listening to them lawyers in the courthouse up the street, and I've come to the conclusion that I'm completely beat. Now the first one, he rises to argue, and he boldly wanders in as he dressed that trembling prisoner in a coat of deep-dyed sin. Why, he covered him all over with a hue of blackest crime, and he smeared his reputation with the thickest kind of grime, till I found myself a-wandering in a misty way, and then how the good Lord could create such an awful man as him. Then the other fellow, the lawyer started, and went tearful, some of the old early attorneys, when I was just a boy and watched them, they would get dramatic. They would actually sometimes stomp on the floor or when they get somebody and they'd get their handkerchief out and shed a tear. And uh, I remember I can tell you that, but we'll talk about that today. <laughs> then the other lawyer started and with tearful brimming eyes said his client was a martyr that was brought to sacrifice. And he gave to that same prisoner every blessed human grace till I saw the light of virtue brightly shining from his face. Then I awed as I was puzzled as to how such a thing could be. And this aggravating question seems to keep a puzzling me. So will someone please inform me in this mystery unfold how an angel and a devil can possess the self-same soul? <laughs> That's the way it is. Then uh, here is a, uh, I thought you might like this one. Now uh, there are some names that you might recognize because some of the people sit in dual signs find Sullivan's in the, in the court cases too. But this is a, uh, on November the 2nd, 1928, uh, a grand jury report. And I thought that it would be interesting to sort of show you that maybe things are a little bit better. We don't give ourselves credit nowadays than they were back then. But anyhow, this was the grand jury report. We the grand jurors asked to make the following uh, report. We have been in session 13 days. 
and we've returned 83 indictments. We find Pendleton County in a grip of a lawless wave as, as you will see by the number of indictments returned. We found whiskey and drunkenness and gambling in high places and low places and drunken and driving automobiles and motorcycles and all sorts of law violations. We can only see one remedy to this. Now you all have heard this a lot of times ever society gets in. We can see but one remedy that the good people of Pendleton County assist the officers by calling them at once. We believe that the courts in the past have been too easy with this, these kind of laws and violations. And we believe that men who knowingly and willfully violate the law, they should have the full extent and they should have to spend every minute in the jail that they do it and that the judges should be a lot stricter on them. So you've heard that one before too. Then, uh, uh, I don't know whether that would work or not sometimes. We just don't know. <clears throat> and as I go through, grand juries uh, way back prior to 1978 would come in and they would examine the uh, courthouse, make sure everything was okay. They would uh, uh, in, uh, investigate the jail and make sure it was run right. And then prior to 1957, it, they didn't have like food stamps or welfare or assistance of people when a family would not take care of you and uh, you didn't have any money you didn't have any means and you were getting old to send you to the county infirmary now many of you remember the county infirmary it was out on hay station road some good land bottom land it had an old colonial type house that had been in disarray but that's where they would put the people and they would live there some of them would be a little bit able to work some of them wouldn't they had you know, three or four cows that they would use for milk and cheese and all those things. They had chickens for their eggs and, and they would hire a farmer. He had to have it before tractors, a team of horses at least, and then the farmer would run that. And uh, we find that the jail uh, is in good shape. We've examined the uh, courthouse. We believe that, we, that there needs to be some plumbing done there. Uh, and um, let's see, and where did we do that? I wanted to do this. Oh, we, we can see that one remedy that, well, I'm on the wrong page, it's whatever. I need another page here. I want to read you the same thing over and over again. Did I ever tell you the same thing twice? <laughs> Certainly. <laughs> You're supposed to brag on me now. <laughs> We have, we have visited the poorhouse or the county infirmary and find it to be in pretty good shape. We do, there was a teenage, a young teenage boy who was blind and they, the grand jury suggested that they send him, because here he was with all those old people, that they send him to school for the blind. And also that they, uh, they said you needed some fresh straw. And, uh, and then uh, we, we also believe this, that there should be more provisions made for the colored women to use a part of the ladies' restroom or an extra room fixed for them. And uh, you often wonder about this. Now, until 1957, when uh, Brown versus Board of Education, do you all ever see black children go to Morgan or Fountain if they were anywhere? Don't think you did now because they didn't do that Brown versus Board of Education. Prior to 1957, all the young black children, they put on a bus, and most of the teenage blacks didn't, didn't go to high school. They'd send them to South Indiana, and uh, uh, that's where they, they went. There wasn't any school until, until there. From there. Um, but anyhow, that is one area that, you know, because they, the black woman didn't have a the women's restroom. You know, remember where that was? Where? Don't check it. Close to where the old jail was. Yeah, been to jail. Yeah. And then the men had a, uh, there was a little uh, building, had a little stove in it. That's where the, all the old timers loafed over there. So they put a lump of coal in. But the black people did not have places to go to the restroom. They didn't have stores and rest areas and what have you. You could go to the woods. So that's one 
compare you to. Some of the other uh, uh, things that you had, the indictments, you had uh, seducing under promise of marriage. Now, a lot of the uh, young people would start courting, maybe 15 or 16 years old. And of course, the fellows would get rambunctious and they would make them promises, make the women promises, because, you know, they would have the pleasures. You know, what happened? They said, we're going to marry you. We're going to marry you. Well, come marry town after she got pregnant. They'd fly the coop, go to another county for a while. Uh, I didn't have to pay or anything, but it, you know, it doesn't. <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> but they had murder, and they had rape, and they had uh, malicious cutting with intent to kill. Now, these are all part of the 83 uh, indictments. And one thing, too, people will tell you this, that there were more religious back then than they were, uh, so we are now. And I still think we've got some, a lot of room to, to improve. But back then, churches were the only places that young people would go. Uh, you know, meet other people, meet kids, and, uh, and every little community had a church. And invariably, that's where the young guys would go get them some moonshine, and they'd come in and get drunk. And out, out in the lot, they wouldn't go in. And they had a lot of disturbing uh, religious worshipers. And uh, I got a little thing there I'm going to share with you, too. And, uh, but here is a typical. Now remember the spider and the fly? You remember Bill Cosby and the 100 women? And I ain't taken up for Bill. I can say ain't now, even though I was an English teacher. You don't have to worry about things like that. Uh, but, uh, but anyhow, you wonder, there are about 100 women, 30 women. What do they do going to a, a man's apartment at night, drinking or whatever they're doing? And I'm sure that some of those women sort of bragged, you know, here they made a kill going with this fine, fine movie star and uh, all this stuff. And they said, well, he, he did this, he, he did that. Spider and the fly. The fly's going to get it. And uh, that happens. Pearl Dunn, <clears throat> this, this is in 18, uh, 1894. Pearl Dunn, some you know, that might be people that you know, some of your relatives all. <clears throat> Pearl Dunn states that Williamville waited upon her for 15 months. She stated that she was engaged to be married to Bell in September. Uh, he let him, let him, she states that in July 94, Bell urged and insisted upon her, uh, letting him to have pleasures with her, telling her that they uh, were soon to be married, so, you know, they are all right. She said she refused him on several occasions, but she was visiting Mrs. Nanner, N-A-N-E-R, <clears throat> on uh, Grassy Creek, and Bell was there when she, he again urged and insisted to visit Mrs. Nanner. And when, and when she got there, Mrs. Nanner wasn't at home, which was the reason he wanted me to go there. When, when uh, we got to Mrs. Nanner's house, we went in, and there being no one at home, we took a seat upon his sofa. Then he overpowered me and had pleasure with me. About two weeks after that, we were coming home. You know, fly keeps coming back. Home from a party at Jason Hamilton's when he again overpowered me. She must not have been too strong. Uh, uh, and had pleasure with me. And another time, when we were coming from a supper on Grassy Creek, he again overpowered me and took the same advantage of me in a buggy as I refused to get out. You know, the, I think they had an old saying back then, you can ride or you can have to walk. So she decided she wasn't going to walk. But anyhow, finally, Mr. Bell, he left the, uh, he, he left there and poor Pearl uh, the, 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 had to pay the consequences. Then here's another one, and talk about education and the brutality of it. This is a girl named, uh, uh, this happened in 1900, Min Minnie Jones, she says, I'm going on 12 years old, and my mother is uh, Alice Jones, my school, my school teacher is Joe Dean. Uh, Mr. Dean punished me on the 22nd day of September 1910. He whipped me with two switches. There was no one in the house uh, when he whipped me uh, at recess. He whipped me until the blood ran out of my back and legs. And he said that if he had had some salt and pepper, he sure would bore me up. But anyhow, uh, the poor girl, all she did, she did. Maybe didn't have permission, but she sneaked there to a, a lady that she knew and had lunch with her. And uh, I guess she just said that she, did, she didn't. 
But anyhow, that's what happened there. $20, that's what he, the charge was. The old age business is tough uh, to deal with. I don't know, some of y'all probably know the same feelings I do. Your life probably might has changed more from the time you're 55 to whatever time you have left than it does your whole early days. And it, more changes take place, they really do. And uh, I catch myself, I like to come to the library. It doesn't take me too long to read the paper. Henry and I like to keep up with it. I do, some of the main things are like uh, uh, the obituaries. And now I've got, so I'll count through, I'm 77, or will be 77 years soon. I'll count how many people are 77 or younger, and how many people are 77 or older. And I'm going to tell you, it's pretty well tied. And so that makes me think, Marvin, you're part of that, that area, that stage. But anyhow, uh, John Quincy Adams, I like this little story, I heard this from all back, it says, when, on, when John Quincy Adams uh, turned 80 on his 80th birthday, he was seen hobbling down one of those little narrow Boston streets, leaning heavily on his cane. And uh, well, a friend that he knew uh, came by and said, morning, Mr. President, how, how are you? John Quincy says, oh, John Quincy's pretty good. But you see this old tenement, talking about his body, the tenement where John Quincy lives, not doing too well. You see the underpinning, that's his legs, the underpinning is just about ready to fall away. The thatch on the roof is all gone. The windows are so down that poor John Quincy can barely see out anymore. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, four winters over, John Quincy might have to move out. As far as John Quincy Adams is concerned, he's never been better. Never been better. And I like that one. Uh, it reminds me of uh, Charles Swindoll. He's a good writer. I like some of his writings. And he uh, tells about attitude. And you know, sometimes when I, the longer I live, I can't almost watch CNN and news or some of the reports. But if I'm not depressed by the time I watch that for about 10 minutes of the morning, uh, I'm ready to go back to bed. But Charles, uh, like John Quincy Adams, I think at any stage of our lives, young or old or whatever it is, that, you know, the attitude is so, so important. I see people driving, bitching, moaning, complaining, excuse that, but anyhow, on television. They're all the time complaining about things. Don't think of the food that the good Lord gives us every day and the freedom that we have to do pretty well what we want to. And uh, uh, friends, and uh, of course, I guess uh, good Lord gave us the best gift of all, and that is the life after death for Jesus our Savior. And none of the things that are most valuable to us do many times. You'll hear people talk about, my goodness sakes, their shrain is from Israel all day. I hate it. They didn't think about bragging on them probably the 10, 15 pretty sunshiny, clear days that we had here a while back ago. No, I'm not preaching, so anyhow. But here's the, <laughs> they get on there much more. Attitude is more important in the past than education and money than circumstances than what will other people think or say or do. It's more important than appearance, giftedness, or skill. It will make or break a company, church, or a home. The remarkable thing is we have a choice every day regarding the attitude we will embrace for that day. We cannot change our past. We cannot change the fact that people will act in a certain way. We cannot change the inevitable. The only thing we can do is play on one string we have, and that is our attitude, and that's true. You all be not an old person. Uh, I, you, you're not going to get by without this one thing. And I guess this is the old English teacher coming out. <clears throat> but I can't pass up from the time we've had our first frost until Thanksgiving. I know it's only the time period that you have for this. <clears throat> and it invariably, especially if you most of you are from the country, uh, uh, visualize this poem. It was written by James Whitcomb Riley, a good old Indiana poet. And uh, this fall of the year, even though I hate to see wintertime come, it's my favorite. I, I just love fall. When the frost is on the pumpkin and the fodder's in the shock and you hear the calc and the gobble of the strutting turkey cock and the clacking of the guineas and the clucking of the hens and the rooster's hallelujah as he tiptoes on the fence. 
Oh, it's then the times the feller gets to feeling in his best with the morning sun to greet him from a night of peaceful rest. As he leaves the house bareheaded on the way to feed the stock when the frost is on the pumpkin and the fodder's in the shop. <sighs> There's something kind of hearty like about the atmosphere when the heat of summer's over and the cool and fall is here. Of course, we'll miss the flowers and the blossoms on the trees and the mumbling of the hummingbirds and the buzzing of the bees. But the air is so appetizing and the landscape on the haze of a crisp and sunny morning of the early autumn days is a picture that no painter has the color in them all when the frost is on the pumpkin and the fodder's in the shock. Ah, the husky, rusty rustle, the tossles of the corn and the rasping of the tangle leaves as golden as the morn. And the stubble in the furries kind of leave lonesome like but still a preaching to us sermons of the barns they grow to fill. The straw stacks in the meadow and the reapers in the shed, not a hoss is in the stall below the clovers overhead. Ah, sets my heart a clicking like the ticking of a clock when the frost is on the pumpkin and the fodder's in the shock. Only one more verse. <laughs> and the apples all is gathered, and the ones a feller keeps is poured around the cellar floor, and red and yellow heaps and your cider makings over, and the women folk are through with their mints and their apple butter and their sauce, sauce and sausage too. I don't know how to explain it, but if such a thing could be, as the angels went and boarding and they called around on me, I'd have to accommodate them, the whole eternal flock, when the frost is on the pumpkin and the fodder's in the shop. Amen. <laughs> so glad to be with you. I hope I didn't bore you too much today. But just thinking uh, <laughs> about things, but I'm going to tell you, uh, there were some rough customers early before people care about other people. And uh, I'm not saying that we're perfect or anything, but we still have so much to to uh, kind of improve on in the thing. Okay, thank you so much.